So, in the wake of Christmas, many of you have been enjoying your new Xboxes, new Playstations, or even new Switches. Not me. Instead, I've been checking out a system that features officially licensed Nintendo games, and it predates the original Xbox, and even the original Playstation. And no, I'm not talking about anything by Nintendo, Atari, NEC, or SNK. I'm talking about the Philips CDI. The system itself isn't all that well known today, as it sold only about a million units. But you might recognise crude animations from two of this platform's most notorious games that's ripe in meme culture. Is there more the system has to offer than just memes? Hello fellow gamers, and let's take a quick look at the Philips CDI. So, the Philips CDI. The first question that's probably crossing your mind is, what the f*** is that? Well, the Philips CDI first came out here in the UK in July of 1992, and it was made to take advantage of a new disc format of the same name to bring interactive multimedia content to people's living rooms. Philips intended for it to make its home in the centre of many people's entertainment setups. The system supported CDI discs and software, audio CDs, photo CDs, CDs with graphics, karaoke CDs, and video CDs. Could I have said CDs anymore? You could play your music on this, you could sing along to lyrics on the TV, you could show off photos from your latest trip to Mallorca, explore an array of interactive software, and watch TV shows and the latest blockbuster films. All on the same device, and all from discs far smaller and easier to store than Laserdisc. With such a wide array of compatible formats, it's no wonder Philips wanted this to be at the heart of any consumer's multimedia setup. Now Philips, as well as a number of other manufacturers, released various different models of the CDI. I think the most commonly one that I've seen on YouTube is the 550 model. A top loader released later in the system's life with a fairly small footprint, which, well, certainly has quite the games console type of look to it, doesn't it? This particular model though, the 220, is one of the first, and you can see that it more resembles a video recorder really, doesn't it? So you can imagine that this would slot in quite nicely to an existing setup in the early 90s. You'd likely have this alongside your existing stereo or video player in the family living room. Now it looks pretty big here, you know, just looking at it, and actually it's pretty heavy. <laughs> so to give you a better idea of its size though, I had to move both my Mega Drive 2 and my CD32 in order to slot this temporarily into my gaming setup. Apparently it's difficult to get a hold of a working CDI today without forking out the pennies, but luckily I have one here in immaculate condition. That's because this one is actually my uncle's, and he had it in his TV and stereo setup all the way back in the early to mid 90s. When he picked up these ones they tended to go for around about 450 quid at the time. That's over 900 pounds today thanks to inflation. I remember seeing him using this when I was a kid, and I knew what it was capable of, thanks to seeing it in Games Master magazine and on ITV's Bad Influence back in those days. Now, you may have noticed all of this time I haven't mentioned anything about games yet, nor referred to the CDI as a games console. Well, that's because, as much as Philips wanted us to call it that at one point, it isn't. I mean, yes, it has games, but its primary purpose was for media consumption, above all else. I mean, if something should be considered a games console just because you can play games on it, then Sky Q is the games console. Beehive Bedlam, anyone? So, uh, yeah. Sorry, Philips. A games console, this ain't. But now we know it isn't really a games console, perhaps we can be a little more forgiving towards it and the games it offers. So let's take a closer look at it. Looking at the device, it certainly looks like it would fit in well with anyone's home theatre setup with minimal inputs on the front. The only buttons present being the on-off switch, the open and close button for the CD tray, which is cleverly hidden behind this large door, and CD player controls on either side of this large LCD screen. And oh, look, it's still got the film on it from way back when. Oh, it's just begging to be peeled. No, no, I must resist. Underneath the LCD display is a little flap revealing an input socket for a wired controller. 3.5mm headphone jack and a volume dial for that headphone jack. Now, a lot of people have given Philips a lot of grief for essentially putting the first player controller part behind a flap, as well as the positioning of the second player part, but we'll get to that bit later. But that's because, again, this wasn't supposed to be a games console. The primary input for this was meant to be via infrared remote. 
The one that came with this CDI is this, the original, what Philips confusingly calls, CDI controller. It features the usual media playback buttons you'd expect of something like a video player, as well as some action buttons surrounding an analog stick, which is something unheard of even today. It blew my mind as a kid seeing the TV being controlled like this via joystick slapped onto a remote control. Of course, you're not going to want to play any sort of intensive games with this, but it's handy for navigating interactive content without having to faff about with the mouse. That's the sort of convenience you want when consuming media in your own living room. As well as crisps. These are seemingly rare to find by themselves at the moment. I could only find one listing for it at the time of recording, at about 55 quid. But of course, Philips wanted people to play games on this as well. And that leads me to another input device that I have for the CDI. This Mega Drive-esque three button gamepad plugged into that port under the flap on the front. And it certainly makes playing games a lot easier than that infrared remote. These aren't all that common today either. At time of recording, used ones were selling for around 70 quid online and new in box ones for twice that. Getting back to the CDI, if we turn it around, we'll find that second controller input that I mentioned earlier. We'll also see this RC6 port, which honestly, I don't know what it does, an RCA video output for composite video, an S video output, and because this is a UK model, a SCART port that outputs in glorious RGB, as well as an RF in and out and your standard left and right audio outputs. Now, for those of you familiar with the CDI already or have seen other YouTube videos about it, you might have noticed this particular one doesn't have a large plate on the back reading Extension slot for digital video cartridge. Well, that's because my uncle was forward thinking enough to get a digital video cartridge installed. And there it is. This is needed for many of the FMV titles that came out for the CDI, movies and games alike, and it came at a hefty price point at the time but it was necessary to enjoy a lot of what the CDI had to offer. And of course, one of those things the CDI offered was a variety of games, and that's all we're really interested in now, isn't it? <laughs> How about we take a quick gander at some of them? Now, how could I have a video on the Philips CDI and not talk about the meme-worthy Hotel Mario? Thanks to a license agreement with Nintendo at the time, Philips was able to have big name Nintendo franchises star in their own games. In the aptly named Hotel Mario, you control Mario through a series of Bowser's hotels, stomping on Goombas and Koopas and the like, shutting all the doors. I mean, yeah, I get it. You gotta keep the drafts out. Heating ain't cheap right now. Now, once you've closed all the doors, you move on to the next stage. To be honest, it's a pretty forgettable platformer. Some of the graphics are cute and it runs quite well. But the only reason people remember it today is for the poorly voiced and animated cutscenes which all look like they've been drawn in Microsoft Paint. And what is it with early disc games and them having to break the fourth wall? And you gotta help us! If you need instructions on how to get through the hotels... It's a trope that I'm glad has died a death these days. It's utter cringe. Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy, this piece is what all true warriors strive for. I just wonder what Ganon's up to. Speaking of licensed Nintendo characters and cringy cutscenes, The Legend of Zelda also made its way over to the CDI. Link Faces of Evil is one of three Zelda titles to grace the platform. <laughs> and I use the term grace loosely because it really doesn't do the franchise justice. One of the Zelda titles is a top-down adventure as you would expect of a Zelda game, but the other two, like this one, are side-scrolling platformers. It isn't even based in Hyrule either. Playing Link, you're flown to the island of Coralie, where Ganon and his minions have taken over. <laughs> Ganon obviously thought it was too costly to take Hyrule again. What does Ganon think Coralie is? A tax haven? Your job is to take him down. The artwork in the game's levels actually aren't that bad, to be fair. It sort of reminds me of the artwork you'd find in the earlier Monkey Island titles, but the music is entirely out of place for a Zelda title. Those cutscenes again are absolutely laughable, and it's brutally difficult to play, even with the appropriate controller. How about a kiss for luck? Yeah, you're gonna need it, mate. I think if you really want to experience this game, at least go for the remastered version you can play on PC instead. For all of five minutes. Dragon's Lair is probably one of the most appropriate game ports to make its way over to the CDI. Originally released in the arcades in 1983, Dragon's Lair was very difficult to port over to other platforms in its original format, you know, due to it being a heavily FMV game. In the arcades, the animation, 
courtesy of ex-Disney animator Don Bluth, was stored on Laserdisc, with different short scenes playing out depending on the player's input. This made it nigh on impossible to port over to floppy or cartridge systems due to their storage limitations. With the advent of CD media, however, it made its way over to home computers, the Mega CD, 3DO, and of course, the CDI. And it runs as you'd expect, really. As far as I can tell, it's spot on to the arcade original, and it is a really fun way of experiencing this game. Another title that fares well on the CDI is The Seventh Guest. It's a 1993 horror game where you're exploring a creepy old mansion filled with spooky apparitions of past guests. You go from room to room and are faced with numerous puzzles which you need to solve in order to progress. Everything in this game is FMV, from each of the computer generated rooms you explore, to the ghostly characters you face, and the puzzles you solve. It's no wonder this is one of the very first games that was only ever released on CD-ROM. The only other way of playing this in the 90s would have been on home computer, which would have been a lot more expensive than a CDI at the time, making this, strangely, the cheapest way of playing the game. You know, despite the CDI alone costing close to 500 quid in of itself. I can see how this would have been well received at the time. Seeing those smooth rendered transitions from room to room would have had people's jaws agape, and it works well even with just the CDI's standard remote control. Now come on, everyone knows Cluedo. Well, except for the US and Canada who call it Clue. Don't! This plays out just like the classic detective board game of the same name. You choose from six characters and you try to solve the murder mystery. There's even a board and a die to throw to make you move. Only this time, when you enter a room, you can search for clues, watch memories from within the room, and you can speak to other players to hear their side of the story. Body always claimed that he didn't know what it was worth, but I found that hard to believe and harder still to forgive. What's also intriguing is that when loaded up, the game will play out one of three different stories, all of which lead to the death in which you're investigating. It adds a nice bit of variety to the game to keep it fresh. Like many CDI games, this has a lot of FMV included, but I think it's been used here in a very appropriate way, making the game feel like a drama that's unfolding before your eyes. The production of the FMV sections was the work of Granada Studios, and it shows. The sets, the lighting, the acting, all of it is brilliantly done and it really draws you in. It's a very interesting take on the classic board game and I must say it's really well presented, but as nice as they are, the FMV segments do slow down the pace of the game dramatically. If you and your friends are going to play this, you're going to need to set aside an entire evening to go through just one playthrough. Not every game on the CDI relied heavily on FMV, and it's about time I mentioned one, and a CDI exclusive no less. The Apprentice is a charming colourful vertical platformer from 1994. You play as Marvin, apprentice to the wizard Gandorf S1 Burner, who sends Marvin out on tasks for him. On the way, you have to evade various hazards as you make your way to the top of each tower. It's possibly one of the smoothest games to run on the CDI, holding at a steady 50 frames per second. Thank you, pal. And Marvin is very easy to control as well. The music is very charming too, though it might start getting on your nerves after a while due to its repetitive nature. On the face of it, The Apprentice looks like a game that was made for the Amiga. It's certainly got the same charm and feel to it, and it's a testament to the Vision Factory's effort in developing this game. No one would blame you if you thought this was the work of Team 17. On the whole, if you lived in the times of Super Frog, Putty and James Pond 2 Robocod, you'll get a lot of fun out of this title. The last game I want to touch upon is a classic FMV filled gunslinger, Mad Dog McCree. In this game, you're tasked to take down Mad Dog and his gang who have taken over an old western town. Like Dragon's Lair, it's a fully FMV arcade game where all the videos were stored on Laserdisc, making it difficult to port accurately to home systems. After having been at the arcades for a couple of years, it only released in Europe on Mega CD, 3DO, and the CDI with the US also getting a version for MS-DOS computers as well. So this would have been one of the only ways for us here to enjoy this game in our own home in the 90s. It's also one of the few games that can use the CDI's Peacekeeper Revolver, a gun accessory made for just this sort of thing. Typically, light guns from early systems don't work on modern displays. Luckily, I don't have to worry about that this time. 
Philips opted to use a separate sensor bar to detect where you're shooting, instead of relying on timing and flashing lights from a CRT. It's more or less the same as what Nintendo adopted for their Wiimotes. With regards to the game, as far as I can tell, it is a faithful part of the arcade original. It plays out the same way, and anyone who likes on-rail shooters will get a lot of fun out of this. Be warned though, that it's just as difficult as it is in the arcades. The slightest hesitation, and you are dead. So, would I recommend getting one of these? Well, I've got to be honest, this will only appeal to avid collectors such as myself, and for anyone who wants to relive the nostalgia, such as myself. Getting one today isn't cheap, and plenty of the must-play games on the platform aren't cheap either. Luckily, it has no copy protection, so you could just burn your own discs for it, but the cost of entry is still very high. Not to mention that there's an issue that plagues every single CDI today. The internal batteries used to store all of your save data have long since died. Often for other systems, that's not a problem. You just replace the cell battery with another one, and away you go. But Philips, in their ultimate wisdom, decided to hardwire the battery directly onto the board, within a chip. The only way to replace this is to butcher that chip and hardwire a new battery through it. Now, sure, I have plenty of experience in modding consoles. In fact, I want to do a similar battery replacement mod to my Dreamcast. But, uh... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be doing it for this machine. Actually, whilst editing this video, I found that there might be an easier way to replace the timekeeper chips in your CDI. I stumbled upon this page that shows that we can actually replace the top of that chip with just a new board and a battery clip, making future replacements much easier. You do still need to butcher the battery a bit, but it looks to be easier to do. And I only just learnt that there are CDIs out there that don't even use the same chip for saving the game data. Luckily though, whole replacements of these are available too, with the same battery clip. Both of these are still going to need a bit of soldering at least, but if you want to give it a go, I'll provide the links to both of these in the video description. So who knows, maybe I'll give it a go after all. Anyway, back to the video. For some people, doing that might be necessary though. Apparently, CDIs refuse to boot when the internal battery dies, but that problem must only be affecting certain models of CDI because, well as you can see, mine boots up just fine. So I don't have an immediate need to make that kind of modification. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend this for anyone besides the avid collector. These units are typically expensive and there's every chance that you're going to have to partially break it in order to fix it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. For those of you who just want to experience the games, many of them have been re-released on newer platforms. And for those that haven't, CDI emulation has made large strides in the last couple of years. You should find a lot of success with that. But with that, I'm going to head off, so thanks very much for watching. Did you have a CDI growing up? How did it hold up for you? And do you still have it in your gaming setup today? Let everyone know down below in the comments. And hey, while you're down there, a like is always appreciated if you enjoyed the video, and there's always that subscribe button if you want to hear more from me. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you all next time.